Most people really struggle with naming the muscles of facial expression, their actions and their innovations. I think this tends to come from the fact that you're taught them all together in one big mush and there's no compartmentalising to help your memory. Today we're going to be learning the muscles of facial expression in the way I learn them, by dividing them up by their nervous supply. I'm Dr Connor Boylan and welcome to More Than Skin Deep. First, let's familiarise ourselves with the facial nerve. This is the seventh cranial nerve, and it gets its name because one of its main functions is to supply the muscles of facial expression. It has some other important jobs, but for today we're just going to consider this function. The facial nerve arises from the ventrolateral pontomedullary junction of the brainstem and passes first into the internal acoustic meatus, then the facial canal. It leaves the skull through the stylomastoid foramen. Immediately after exiting through the stylomastoid foramen, the facial nerve produces its terminal branches, six of which we should familiarise ourselves with today. The first branch we want to know about is the posterior auricular branch, which runs backwards behind the ear, hence its name. Next, we have the superior division, which splits into two more branches. These are the temporal branch, which runs over the temple towards the forehead, and the zygomatic branch, which runs over the zygomatic bone towards the nose. Lastly, we have the inferior division, which gives us the last three branches of the facial nerve. The first is the buccal nerve, which runs across the cheek towards the upper lip. Then we have the marginal mandibular nerve, which runs over our mandible towards the chin. And lastly, we have the cervical nerve, which runs straight down into the neck. There are loads of mnemonics we can use to remember these six branches of the facial nerve, but the one that I've heard most often is, please, to Zanzibar by motorcar where P is for posterior auricular, T is for temporal, Z for zygomatic, B for buccal, M for marginal mandibular, and C is for cervical. Okay, now let's move on to look at our muscles of facial expression. All of our muscles of facial expression act to move small or large parts of the face in order to express emotion and help us perform specific actions like speaking, chewing, or shutting our eyes. The muscles mostly originate from the bones of the viscerocranium and mostly insert directly into the skin overlying them, making them pretty unique amongst muscles of the body. The way we're going to look at the muscles of facial expression today is through the lens of what nerve innervates what. The first thing to bear in mind as we do this, which will become a little more obvious later, is that only a few of the muscles of facial expression are innervated by one nerve only. Most have dual supply from two adjacent nerves. I'll set up a little diagram to the side so we can visualise this a little easier. Each coloured box on the diagram will correlate with a specific nerve, and when you see the boxes overlap, it means that both nerves are acting together to innervate the muscle. The second thing to be aware of is the terminology we're going to use. This will make it a lot easier to remember what the muscle does and where it connects, so pay attention. Typically, the name of a muscle will include the part of the face that it's acting on, for example, auricularis muscles act on the auricle or ear. Oris muscles act on the oral region or mouth. And a nasolabialis muscle will act on the nose as well as the lips or labia. The other part of the muscle's name will frequently include the action of that muscle. For example, a levator muscle will lift part of the face upwards, whilst a depressor muscle will pull it downwards. Putting that together, we can work out that the depressor anguli oris muscle will pull the angles, or corners, of the mouth downwards. These naming rules don't apply to all the facial muscles, but they're helpful to bear in mind when you're struggling to remember what a certain muscle does. Okay, with all that in mind, let's start with the posterior auricular nerve, which goes to the muscles supplying the micro-movements of the ear. The three muscles we're interested in here are the auricularis posterior, auricularis superior, and auricularis anterior. These three muscles all attach to different parts of the auricle, or ear, and pull it in their respective directions. Auricularis posterior pulls it backwards, superior upwards, and anterior forwards. I'm sure you know somebody who can waggle their ear around voluntarily. About 10 to 20% of people have this ability, and those that do have these muscles to thank. All right. That's it for the posterior auricular nerve, so let's move on to the next in line, the temporal nerve, which comes off the superior division of the facial nerve. 
The first thing to note is that the temporal nerve actually has a hand in innovating all three of the muscles we've just discussed, as well as its own unique innovations. The other muscle in the ear region innovated by the temporal nerve is temporoparietalis. If you've watched my previous video on the anatomy of the scalp, you'll know that this muscle is a little controversial amongst anatomists. It's often reported in older texts and is said to insert into the epicranial aponeurosis to provide some tension in the scalp. However, its clinical significance and even existence is uncertain. For now, let's just recognize that it may be innervated by the temporal nerve and then move on. The rest of our muscles of facial expression are best viewed from this anterior view of the viscerocranium that we saw earlier. This big chunky muscle that sits in our forehead is known as the frontalis and it joins the epicranial aponeurosis which eventually connects it to the occipital muscle at the back of the head. The frontalis functions mainly to raise the eyebrows and tension the scalp. It's innervated entirely by the temporal nerve. The next muscles we're interested in are these two small, thin muscles that sit under the eyebrows on both sides. They are known as the corrugator supercilii muscles, and they draw the eyebrows inferior medially in this direction. They're also innervated purely by the temporal nerve. The last muscles innervated solely by the temporal nerve are these two triangular shaped muscles which pull the eyebrows downwards. They are thus known as the depressor supercilii. The next two muscles we'll look at receive innervation from both the temporal nerve and the subsequent zygomatic nerve. Firstly, we have the single central procerus, named so because it is tall and long. Procerus goes from the fascia over the nasal bone to the skin of the forehead and pulls the medial eyebrow downwards in a similar way to the depressor supercilii. The last innervation of the temporal nerve is the large circular muscle that surrounds the eye, orbicularis oculi. This muscle can be further divided into a palpable part, which forms the inner ring, and an orbital part, which forms the outer ring. It's thought that the palpable part periodically involuntarily contracts to aid the blinking reflex, whilst the orbital part can contract to more forcefully close the eye. When the whole orbicularis oculi contracts together, it holds the eye tightly closed. Okay, the next muscles we're going to consider are all innervated by the zygomatic and buccal nerves together. The first of these muscles is the levator nasolabialis. This has a medial and lateral part that connect to the alar cartilage of the nose and the upper lip, respectively. As the name suggests, these muscles pull the corners of the nose and the upper lip superiorly. Next are the paired depressor septi nasi. These tiny muscles attach to the septum and ailer of the nose to pull them downwards. Then we have the levator labi superioris muscles, which act in a similar way to the levator nasolabialis to lift the upper lip. And the levator anguli oris, which attaches to the corner of the mouth to lift it upwards, for example, when you smile. The last two muscles that share innervation from the zygomatic and buccal nerves are the large and small muscles originating from the zygomatic bone of the facial skeleton. Because of this, they are known as zygomaticus major and zygomaticus minor, respectively. These muscles both act with levator anguli oris to lift the upper lip and corners of the mouth superiorly, as well as a little bit laterally. The next three muscles are all innervated by the buccal nerve only. They also have unique one-word names, which in my opinion makes them easier to remember. The first of these is the nasalis. This muscle acts solely on the nares, or nostrils. Nasalis can actually be divided into a transverse part, which constricts the nostrils, and an alar part, which dilates them. Then we have the buccinator, which sits deep inside the cheek and attaches to the corners of the mouth. It acts mostly to compress the cheeks, and thus helps move food around the mouth when chewing. Lastly, we have the cute little rhizorius muscle, my personal favourite of the muscles of facial expression. This muscle gets its name from the Latin origin rhiza, which literally means laughter. This gives us a clue as to the muscle's function, which is in pulling the side of the mouth laterally, protruding the lips and pushing them together, for example when laughing. OK, we're nearly there. The next four muscles are all innervated by the marginal mandibular branch of the facial nerve. 
The first two of these muscles also share innervation with the buccal nerve. The first muscle we'll consider here is the mighty orbicularis oris. This single, unpaired muscle is similar to the orbicularis oculi muscles we looked at earlier. It is an annular muscle that encircles the opening for the oral cavity. Also like the orbicularis oculi, orbicularis oris consists of an outer ring, known as the marginal part, and an inner ring, known as the labial part, pertaining to the lips. The function of orbicularis oris is to compress the lips together and protrude them, for example when you are whistling or pouting. The last muscle with a shared innervation is the depressor anguli oris. This muscle originates from the mandible and inserts into the corners of the mouth. You can think of it like the evil twin of levator anguli oris, as instead of pulling the corners of the mouth upwards into a smile, it pulls them downwards into a frown. The last two muscles are innervated by the marginal mandibular nerve only, and both act on the underside of the mouth. Depressor labi inferioris inserts into the middle portion of the lower lip and acts to pull it downwards. And finally, the mentalis muscle originates from the mandible and inserts directly into the skin overlying the chin, or mental region. It acts a little to protrude the lower lip, and produces that strange dimpling effect seen in some people when they're very sad or crying. Okay, just one last muscle to go. The massive platysma originates all the way down in the chest from the pectoral fascia and deltoid fascia overlying the pectoralis major and deltoid muscles. It travels upwards in the superficial skin to insert into the inferior mandible and the various muscles in the lower part of the face. Its action is a little strange, but basically it acts to tense the skin of the neck as well as depress the mandible slightly. And there we go. That's every single muscle of facial expression, their actions and the nerves that innervate them. I'll leave this image on the screen for a moment so we can appreciate the huge amount of information we've covered today. If you're interested in learning more of the anatomy of the face, we have videos covering the scalp, surface anatomy and much more. Check them out here and please consider subscribing to the channel so we know you enjoyed the video and want to see more like it. That's all from me. Thank you for watching and have a great day.